exciting interventions for the rest of the day. And the first one is by Anton Matsurov, who is a film critic and distributor and actor and whatever. And uh, he has a company called Antipod, which is also known in the west of part of Europe. So come up and talk, please. Thank you. A warm welcome. Hi, colleagues. Hi, guys. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to speak up in Russian because main part of audience speaking and feeling Russian here and because I prefer to be more emotional than formal. I really don't like to show letters on the screen. So I'm not going to show you the letters. I'm going to show you my body and then a bit of visual material for you. My speech is going to be as follows. Some personal part. I'll try to explain what we're doing as a company. And then I'm going to talk about, about the common situation about distribution of documentary films in Russia and Russian films abroad. And finally, I'm going to raise a problem that's been bothering me f for quite a while on the theoretical level now. I'm working in the cinema on the international level. Since 1996, I started in the Museum of Cinema as vice director uh, together with Kleiman. Then I worked in PR of big Hollywood films of UIP companies. That means the Paramount Studio and DreamWorks and whatnot. And then I was together. I was together with Klebanov, working with the company Cinema Without Borders. That means art house films and everything, everything we worked with and distribution, the art house films, including the film clubs, classics. That, I mean, we were technically know everything what was happening in Russia with the documentary films, art house films. Then I was working in Tomorrow Film Festival as a programming director. And then four years ago, I made a company that is called Antipod. Antipod is a very good word, very convenient. When there are a lot of companies and there's a lot of competition on the market, you have to have really good names. So you start either with a letter or with a number or with letter A. So you'd be in front of the list of a lot of companies. So when we were working with a movie theater called uh, 35 millimeter, millimeters, it was the only venue for art house films in Moscow. This name, 35 millimeters, was very important for us, was one of the criteria for um, distribution, art house distribution in Russia, because 35 was in the beginning of all the lists, because it started with numbers. Well, antipod is a very nice and convenient word. Ante is Anton, and pod is a Podolska, Elena Podolska, who is my partner. That's very, uh, this is, uh, we don't have the government funding. We don't have, we don't take um, any credit in the bank. It's, it's art house. We don't have people financing us on the side. There are 14 people in the company, one four, and we're financing everything on our own. I consider the situation normal, even though we do have sales as a company. And we have the words profits figurating in our reports, but I wouldn't wouldn't take them very seriously because it's a very art project, it's a very experimental project. I put the catalog. If somebody took it, please look at it. If you guys didn't get the catalog, I have more, so please ask me. So we are four years old, the company Antipod. We are doing things constantly. We have about 70, 70 films in the catalog of our company. I'm also teaching. 
So, of course, I'm saying a lot of good words about myself, such as of all people that are really working in the film business, buying and selling films, I am the only teacher. So I hear what my colleagues say. They say I teach, but you know, they don't know the material. I'm the only teacher in the buying, selling films in Russia. So that's my company, Antipod. Um, my company passed several stages of development. Oh, it's boring for me to do the same things every day. So every half a year, during the four years, we were um, putting our level a bit up, like in electronic games. First, the company was like a boutique of the cinema in Russia, and we thought we would choose some beautiful Russian films, uh, put them on international film festivals, and we would get the profits. But what we saw, if you really select the films as you select for the boutique, the diamonds, you choose the shades and the colors, you can't really find anything in Russia because we don't have the diamond films. It's very coward-like, very not modern cinematography in Russia, and not relevant cinematography in Russia. Before that, we were looking at films from with the um, buyer's eye, with the distributor's eye. So in some sense, our eye was not sharp enough. As soon as we sharpened, zoomed in our eye, we saw that uh, the situation is rather sad. So we will never have a boutique. We'll ha have to um, control the market in some way and so have a wider scope. But we can't really widen the market right away because there are a lot of problems, such as the market is very competitive. Formerly, there are 22 companies in Russia who are like called sales agents, the ones who sell the um, rights for the, for the film rights. Um, we work for percentage, so we take all the rights in the world minus the territories that think that they're better than us, such as former USSR, sometimes Israel. They have some spooky stories with the rights, the film rights. But in order to compete with those 22 companies that exist in the world market, I'll tell you later about these companies. We had to take some extra steps. We have to find some really strong players, producer players in the market. Then everybody would see that you work with a strong person and they would give you give you their films. And so step by step we chose the, the stars and we worked with them and that's that's how we survived. I've been for twenty years in the industry and then I had really good relations and that's how it worked. But then de facto what happened is my old reputation as an art house distributor works really well. Producers think that I am an art house person, obviously. So if you have big films with huge budget, like an icebreaker, for example, it's like $20,000 film. So these big films, they don't see me as a person for them because I'm an art house person. That's a bit of a problem in the end. We are art boutique, because being an art house producer. So it's the cinema d'auteur of Russia. We're not a monopoly in that sense, because the second problem is like the really Russian psychological problem. It would be new for Europe, this problem. That is, when you come to a producer, to a Russian producer, he has a film or two films. You want to take that film. Before the moment you came to the producer, the producer didn't know what to do with that film. He just was not thinking about that film at all. Nobody wanted that film. Nada. So you had the film per se, but nobody wanted to put the hands on that film. But the Russian producer becomes big as a fish is getting big in the story of a fisherman. And then he changes the story with you. He tells you, he thinks that he really needs that film. After you pop the balloon and he becomes small again, then you can talk to him again about an agreement, you know, like in Europe you do. We first try to sign the contract, the detailed contract. 
I must say that a lot of Russian companies do not sign the agreement, the contract right away. That is a bad idea. Always sign the contract. So we start signing a contract. That's the worst. That's the hardest work with a Russian producer. It takes months. Then there is a second psychological option of the Russian producers. They try to find a way you're trying to cheat them. The stage when they really think that they need that film, okay, that's passed. Now the second stage, he's lying to me, meaning me. You know, there, there's a person who is dealing with the contracts. I'm not doing that anymore because we had to diversify. I, I can't work with that. The second game level was we took documentary films. Some, some Russian sales companies have documentaries that they offer, but there is not a specific person who is working with documentaries. There is no idea how to work with them. So producer, of course, can bring their film to a festival. They can sell their films on their own to a festival. But producers usually have other job than working with the documentaries. Theoretically, after starting our business, I'm, I can say that after the digital revolution, nobody really needs the movies. I'm not talking about the Hollywood movies where everything is tipped off. But all the European cinema, all the Asian cinema, nobody really needs those films. And what nobody needs cannot have the price. So the price for a film is zero. Whatever producer thinks about that, whatever director thinks about that, doesn't matter how much emotion they have, how many years they worked in the movie, how much money they invested in film, be that government money or private investors' money. However many people die during the during making of this film, when you have the movie, unless the movie is done in Hollywood, the price is zero. So there is a film, if there is no hand to catch it, it's going to fall. There are some exceptional films, of course, that are so relevant, but these are exceptions. It doesn't change the overall situation. Exceptional films can be very loud, can be like a comet, and they not necessarily bring any money for people who sell them. So we need the hands to catch the film. Producer and director can perhaps carry their film in their arms, but there has to be professional arms. So director and uh, producer, it's not enough. And I think we as a company, we are the hands that carry the film. The world market of such hands is very competitive in the world. And during the last seven years, the prices fell drastically in that market. Nevertheless, it's a very good, very competitive market in Europe and in the world. But in Russia, there are only 22 companies. As such, um, these companies were in the Cannes Marché du Film. About five are really working well. Two companies are really making huge profits. One of Timur Mikbambetov and the other one is with Art Animation. But they have their own small niche that's animation films. And it's on a very, very good level that they're working. But these two companies bring quite good profit, the biggest profit in Russia, perhaps, in that area. Then Planet, Planet Inform, that's the third company. They get five um, blockbusters, Russian blockbusters, that they sell. They choose a girl, a Russian girl, for one year who works. She, show, she shows the um, trailers in different markets. She gets the customers for that market. So in the end, she gets from seven till 15 territories to buy and screen that film. So they, they make some money, but again, that's like not, not the state of the art kind of work. But that's it. There are some companies 
that are working with some kind of films. We know mostly nothing about them. Some of them are state budget companies. So, so again, there is a sweet girl with one or two foreign languages and just sits in the company and sort of promotes the film. Nobody knows what she does, just quiet work. I try to put my people to that sort of ghetto that's called the stand for the Russian films. But like the idea is you are representing Russia as a country, as a country as it is now for the last 17 years has been. I don't think a lot of people would be attracted to that ghetto. That would be or some foreign intelligence spies or the Russians who live abroad. So I, I don't think that's a good promotion tool. But what I saw, I have three employees that work, that sit and work there. Then there's some small traffic of people. They come and talk in different languages. They speak English and French. And a lot of Russians who are part you know, part of the market, as soon as it's not English, they just stop talking. So it's just very low level. They just sit and wait. And apart from those companies that I've been talking about now, is Antipod Sales, my company. Then there are other companies that are not turning to us, but they just take the Russian films and give them to the hands of the foreign distributors big foreign distributors, such, for example, a new film by Zvagintsev that started this August, the big monster of uh, arts film distribution is selling that film. That's well batch company that used to be a part of the big holding which is still strong of that can Canal Plus holding. Well, I, I cannot, I shouldn't judge. It's their professional choice. The movie by Zvagintsev, the last one, was sold in 45 countries, so it's a great result. So they're doing very well. Our record from Antipod is 22 countries per film. That's Konchalovsky film. Uh, the White Knight of Postmaster Alexei Trepitsin. It got the Venice um, Silver Lion Festival, the Grand Prix, 22 countries. So there are some elderly people drinking close to the lake. So it's not interesting if you just talk about that. But the format attracted a lot of attention. This film was out of any format. That's why we managed to sell it in 22 countries. It's still being sold, it's still being in a lot of festivals, even though now we have a different film, Paradise, that is um, laureate for Oscar from Russia, Oscar nominee from Russia. The director showed us other films by him, and he already got the uh, Grand Prix in Venice the house for the House of Fools. Fortissimo is a company who was distributing that film. And Gu Moon was also selling his film. He showed the results of those companies. Uh, and he told us that through all the, the history of my films being sold, you guys as Antipod sold the most because you sold 20, my film in 22 countries, which is a record, but that's our job. Now, coming back to the diversification, as soon as we face the problem that the Russian films, please don't take me, you know, don't be offended, but it's not good cinema now. So we want, then we wanted to diversify the market, to widen the market, and it, we turned out that it's very difficult to come to an agreement with the Russian producer. We started, we started acquiring the rights for foreign films, and we're the only one in Russia wall sales company that owns the rights for foreign films. We have films from Poland, from Romania, from Sweden, from USA, from Switzerland, from Denmark, Denmark, and we have all the rights, uh, and the rights in Russian also, even though for perhaps Russia is really not a big perspective for those great films, but I'll talk, I'll come back to it later. The next level for us was um, documentary films. 
we started from Rasbeshkina school. I was um, taking an exam in one of the uh, teaching courses of hers. So five best films according to the audience choice. The audience comes just from anywhere. We had the rating by students, rating by the teachers, and the the five were the the third rating was just from the regular audience. And then there was the last film, the optical axis. I thought this film to be a very conceptual project, and I was just starting the uh, documentary film sales, and I wanted to do it in an exceptional manner, something new, something different, and something different was for me that Rasbeshkina school. So by accident, I put the Marina Alexandrova optical access film there also. Then I wrote an article for Screen International about the Rasbeshkina school. So we started to work with this bunch of bundle of films that we chose. Two years passed. What we learned? Marina Alexandrova, of course, Rasbeshkina was thinking too much about her school and about the influence her school does in the world. Even though the films are in demand, they go to different festivals, they, they visited, somebody even bought them. So, it's, I mean, it's not bad. The strategy is rather good. The strategy of Rasbeshkina is rather good. Her strategy is as you are involved in the material with your body, you live together with a personage, your director, your producer, and her strategy as a brand. I don't think it's too too much in demand, except for some of the really exceptionally Russian character films. So since my expectations to Rasbeshkina school, and you know, I, I'm not crazy, I had rather modest expectations, I really thought it would work, these were my expectations, but it didn't work. And one of the movies by Rasbeshkina died, and it died first, I think, in the Leipzig Film Festival because nobody really worked with it separately because it was part of um, the package and together with her in the package there were her students so I mean that's a long story she I mean she, we don't work with her anymore like I like her we still talk but don't work there anymore anyway what I learned is that we have to divert how the international documentary market is diversified so we chose a person who would work with documentaries and we managed to achieve the level when even we could use the Rasbeshkina experience. We started to take Western documentaries, so now we have quite a lot of them, about 70, 70. That's how we work. I'm going to show you five trailers because in the package of our company inside the documentary films, inside the package, they are diversified. That's yet the next level for our work. We diversify documentaries. Something uh, science fiction, something that could be called feature art, something artsy, the, and the protest films, where the only company in Russia that sells the Russian protest rebel cinema. If you're a local distribution, you, uh, distributor, you can buy this protest film directly from the producer because people make a lot, a lot of protest rebel films in Russia, but we sell them too. We have five films, the protest films, and I'm going to show you after my speech. The fate of those films is different from film to film. Working with the United States, who were very interested in all the package of protest rebel cinema I mean we, we felt a little bit of a bit of a Cold War thing working with the states after the war started in Ukraine because we're a Russian company and you know who the states are supporting especially the um, northern part of the states so there was some sort of embargo because even the festivals with which we worked before, they just didn't take any films from us. Now it's getting a bit easier, but we felt that frozen out situation also in Europe. Somebody was direct with us saying that, come on, you know, that's the situation. But anyway, the fate of protest rebel films 
was different from film to film. The film my friend Boris Nemtsov got the Grand Prix in Krakow, so it's going to be shown in Itva in Amsterdam in the biggest documentary film festival in the world. Then uh, the film Putin Forever, question mark. You see a producer, Masha uh, Muskevich, with us today. It's going to be in the Warsaw. Um, competition on October 14 is screening and October 28 it's going to come out in the movie theaters in Poland it's not going to come out here ever in Russia but in Poland you see it in the movie theaters and after our informational blow is tied to Poland Warsaw you understand it's not the most important festival in the um, world map Perhaps it's not really a business festival, but anyway, all the Eastern Europe is really interested, and then we have a lot of demands to watch this film, and a lot of demands to talk about that film. Then uh, um, another film is The Performance and Punishment, also got a huge resonance, and it's also among the competition film in the Warsaw Film Festival, and there's a huge interest even though we didn't have the information blow in that film, but we're working with a lot of, we're working a lot with the United States. And there's also a very important insurance thing. Um, it's important for the States, not for Russia, that the nature is everybody who is in the, in the frame um, is not against the fact that they're in the movie. Well, we're going to resolve that problem, because for the States it's very important, for Russia this concept is just not existing. So that's a few words about the work of my company. You understand that it's a very good company, we have a good standing. About the overall situation in Russia, when, you know, when Tua was asking the question, you see what's happening is beautiful, Elizabeth, a beautiful Lizalot and telling a great report about the experience exchange, information exchange. Then you have Sicily, and you have other beautiful ladies who tell us beautiful numbers. We cannot answer with the beautiful numbers from Russia. There's a very famous cartoon, and I'm going to cite this cartoon. Um, there's a citation from a dialogue between the postman and the cat. One is asking, why are you not buying a cow? Do you not have enough money? And the cat says, no, no, we have money, we don't have brains. So this, we have money, we don't have brains, is the biggest problem for Russia. And how is that? It's a huge country. It's always been a huge country, even before Peter the Great. With a European orientation. How can this country, even a very great cultural level, both 19th century and the Russian avant-garde. How come we don't have brains? That's an insult. But when you don't have brains, it doesn't mean that your skull is empty. Maybe there is a brain, but sick brain. The person is sick, so the brain is not functioning. But the effect is the same. You don't have brains. They're not working. Brains that are responsible for the cultural policy and that is responsible also for the cinematography. This brain is damaged. Part of this damage is corruption. For 20 years I've been observing different um, grades, different shades of corruption, also on the Ministry of Culture, and I know this problem on the level of last names, so I know a lot as I worked in the area. It's a huge part, never went anywhere. The second part. Nepotism. The other part is nepotism. On the one hand, everybody has equal rights and they take part in the competition. But on the other hand, the person who, on the outcome, is on the outcome because of the nepotism. It's a very old um, damage. But the third problem is yet, especially since we have this wonderful Ministry of Culture, this ideological tumor, cancer tumor. And thanks to that horrible ideological tumor that becomes worse than a censure, 
I mean, for example, Lev Kosakovsky, who just left because he didn't get any money. But he left, and now he is the most demanding cinematograph, uh, documentary cinematographer of Russia. Uh, Matsky, for example, is a very controversial person. But this is the fact. He left. He left for Riga. He lives in Riga because nobody gave him any money for making films here, and he gets the money in Riga. And director has to make films. You know, the eight. What Dali liked to say is that if you're an artist, if you're a painter, then you have to paint. That's the rule. So these are the three problems that damage the brain. That's why we have no brain in Russia, we say as a cat from a Soviet cartoon. We worked on only one of the problems in a rather strange way. So what we're sitting where oh, we're doing, we're sitting with, with our ass on the needle of state support, if I may say that in these terms. And the cinema, um, at the very roots, has the state support. But I'm still coming back to the three diseases that I enumerated. And I always remember about them. So this state support becomes really like the needle for um, like needle for the drug addict and it switches away the brain. So again, I come back to the fact that we have no brain in the end. When we talk about a documentary film guild, it can't move forward in this, it can't move forward in its functions just also because of this needle destroying the brain. I am not a member of the guilds because they have a birth defect. They are like uh, Some batteries. They, solar batteries. They are on solar batteries. And therefore, they have commands. So the 33rd command was orient to the sun, look at the sun. And that stops all the work. So I mean, I mean, it's, it's really weird. It's really weird. And this idea kills the idea of independent guild because they're waiting they're waiting for support and support as i said earlier as we remember is the needle who kills the, that kills the brain so we don't have a system um, the danish film institute has the system the swedish film institute has the system and we're working with both those institutes we don't have that system in russia so the state has a monopoly on um, the cinema, and Shah Nazarov is always asking for it, but I mean, we already had it in the state, as a state cinema. So if you, th if you look very um, lightly on the surface, we have everything, we have some bureaucrats who give money, we have guilds, some sort of guilds, but it doesn't work as a system. So there's this total destruction of the common cinematographical cinematographical brain and you know technically we don't have any cultural policy because there is um, pressure from the government and then it's worse than the censure because on top of that we have um, auto censure and that's not the only problem because technically the government could have um, had some intellectual will the society could form some principles and parameters and the guilds could follow those parameters well every now and then there are some attempts like that for example let's unite the experts make a guild make a, cine um, make a union of cinematographers that is against the official one but with Mikhalkov. So there are some attempts. I personally was a witness to such attempts. And as a teacher, I was telling to the first head director general of the Fund of Cinematography, and I was telling the first one and the second one what to do, how to think. Of course, I was telling a little bit, because it doesn't make sense to say a lot if we don't have brains, then it's just not worth it because there's no system. We don't know where to invest the money. Nobody can offer semantics uh, meaning that would later on turn into structure, so we don't have a structure. There's no structure because there must be a corru corruption. Everybody understands how that's how the bureaucrats are sitting on their posts. 
sit and sit and continue their corruption tradition. I understand. I'll be faster, sorry. So we have the bureaucrats that distribute the money. We have state cinema, part of the Ministry of Culture. We have an institution that is called the Cinema Fund that is kind of moderating the um, commercial cinema, but it's never working anyway. You have some majors, something else. I, I think they're trying to work like Hollywood, but in different conditions because they're in Russia. So they are supporting this nepotism schemes. We kind of have archives, one of the oldest cinema archives, most cinema fund. The oldest one, I think, I don't know if you'd agree with me, I think it's in Vgik in Moscow that uh, exists since 1919. I don't know if it's true. I think Nordisk is older, but I don't know. You guys could tell me. But anyway, in Vgik, they're telling that we're the oldest. So we have all the archives, which just doesn't work. We have international support, but again, technically it's a ghetto. It doesn't really work. It's, it's again the nepotism and the films that they need, they promote. Some people sit at the tables, something is happening, but it's, as Zhvanetsky told us, if you don't like how it smells, just go away. So a lot of professionals are going away from that. So something kind of, thanks to Wizards, um, it, it kind of works. So Russian cinematography is like a theater that is not structured inside and doesn't have um, any way out. It doesn't have um, the plug to be um, plugged into world um, universal computer. So nothing is unless we have a good structure, nothing's going to change. And we shouldn't wait for the good minister of culture. It's not going to help. I remember good ministers of culture like Shitko, and the corruption was in a higher level than now. It's the problem of structure, and then it's a problem of mobilization. So, you know, just come to the mirror and ask, what can I do if I'm interested in working together? Because I'd like also to show the numbers and letters and your beautiful presentation as the ladies were given early on today. But for now, no, there's no chance. And then final part, 20 years work in this market make me make very sad conclusions. I already said that nobody really needs the films. They co the price is zero. How do we resolve that problem personally? When there are good hands, the sales companies that are ready to take the film, these hands find a person who is responsible for the film. So that's, again, the personality factor. How does that business work? Well, I mean, think about any business. We don't only sell films. We can sell, for example, leather bags. And there's a target audience. They see the bag and they say, oh, I really love the bag. And the business starts. Somebody wants to sell the bag. Somebody wants to buy the bag. What's the difference between this, this impulse and this energy and buying the leather bag? from the energy when you watch the film. That's very simple. From the back, that's very little amount of energy. From the film, that's big energy, much more. Could be positive energy, could be negative energy, it could be something very complicated, but this huge amount of energy. So those who work in this business, let's call it a business, they are those drug addicts who want to live on that energy that they get from watching the movie, from that energetic impulse. So the moment after you watch the film, you have to work with the film, you have to offer the hands, you have this energy, you have to find somebody to give that film to, give the energy together with the film. So when the price is zero, it starts being a bit more than a zero. As soon as you find a partner, so, quote, a buyer, there's an electric impulse between you. So potentially there could be a price for the film. You sign the contract. Maybe, you know, may, maybe nothing works later on. This contract doesn't work. It doesn't matter. It's in the future. Maybe he pays only 20%, doesn't work further. But anyway, it starts working. Because you have to do it fast. You have to be very quickly. You know, the drug addicts, how they are, they have a lot of impulses. The same with film. You have new impulses that take, away, take out the old ones. Remember about the budgets, maybe the budget. So, so have the impulse, pass it on very quickly. 
you sign and inside the zero price of that film, you have some number, so the film gets the price. So the price gets born in the hands where you put the film in. So the film is zero price-wise before the hands take this impulse and convert it in the money equivalent. That's the business. What's the problem? It's a format that we're facing. I watched the Russian film. I personally so I think I was calculating about 500 films on the screen. Anyway, I see it on the screen, I see it on my computer, but anyway. And I sought those films, especially since I'm a professional. I, I graduated from Geek. I have a lot of colleagues who work with the festivals, who buy a lot of films, who are looking for producing projects during the pitching. They also watch a lot of films and they sort them out. What happens in the end? Remember when the, um, the eye becomes soapy? When you look and you don't see. And that really sucks. That's the worst that I've seen when the eye becomes soapy. When looking at the Russian cinema of today, Overall, I have to work with the Russian cinema because it's part of my business. These are the films that I we can get earlier than other people can get them. I mean, we're good on the market. I watch those films, and in order to uh, produce the interest in those who get the films, I have to find something that is different. My eye is very soapy. So it starts taking something according to a stereotype. I understand the television channel formats. They have really rigid formats, and they know what they have to select to sell. But this soapy eye I see also on the festival levels. The films that look different from what we saw in the years before, we just forget about them. We lose them. We think, well, they're just really strange. They're not fitting. And I really suffer from that. Now I chose several new Russian films that they have really huge energy, very exclusive energy. But like, I can't feel it. Like I know it's there. But if we take if we take Kino Tower as a festival, they didn't select those films. I mean, think about it. That means their eyes is soapy, and that's the worst Kino Tower since '98. Well, anyway, I'm almost done. Almost done. Sorry. So you take the rights, the film rights. Very good films, Western films, some American film that went through 150 festivals. It didn't get any award, but it's good film that was present in many festivals. A good documentalist worked on it. 150 festivals, imagine. So huge audience. There are some other films, sweet, nice, different topics. So it's not a collection of my favorite films. It's just films that I can compile and I can work with them in Russia. I have, I'm talking about the rates, have the rates on, in Russia, but nobody needs those great international films in Russia. I'm very, exp I'm very experienced, so I can do the art house screening. I don't resolve any super tasks, but like nobody, what I can see as a professional, nobody needs documentary films. There are no slots for documentary films on television. Of course, there was something in the channel culture, Canal Cultura, but it's not enough. It's like almost not there, this slot for documentary films. Besides, they have their own, own understanding what they have to buy. It's their own personal positioning in the channel, in a television ch channel. There are also this beautiful channel, 24 Dogs. We have uh, Alexei Leifour representing it. We presented film to them as well, and Leifurov told us he's going to tell us tomorrow. He wrote to me, we're not interested in your film. So, a problem. But we have all the rights. We're responsible in front of production companies to release the film. So we created some media atmosphere, but zero profit, zero rubles, zero copies. So Russia is like an empty spot in the world map. 
So we have to find some channels how to distribute, how to convert that to distribute. Now, the five um, little five trailers to show to you. How long is the five trailers? How long is it? How long? Yeah, how long? I suppose how? 10 minutes, maybe, maybe eight. Eight minutes, okay. Let's do it quickly, yeah, please. If there are any questions, I'm also happy to answer them. Yeah, but my suggestion is because we are running a little uh, late and it would be a little unfair to the last speaker that we have the last speaker after the trailers and then we can discuss if you're still interested because there's so much to discuss after Anton's uh, intervention. Who is showing the trailers? Okay.
Ведь Конституция это хорошо, замечательно. Но мне даже не интересно читать. Что я буду читать? Те права, которых у меня нет? У кого есть эти права, пусть те салюты бросают. У меня этих прав нет, поэтому я даже не знала, что у меня свои деньги Конституции. I'm sorry that it took so long. I'm sure that many people would like to, to discuss also and comment on what you were saying, but uh, we are only one hour behind schedule, so I think it would be fair to, to stop at this point. Wonderful to see moving images, and I know that the next speaker also has some gems for us, so uh, please introduce the next speaker. And I think we need also a little technical shift. 